Hey, welcome to the show. I have a special guest here today, my new friend, Josh Barbin. We just met because he wrote this amazing blog post yesterday, or I read it yesterday, that has put together all of these different components in the sort of world of things that I research around the future of money and blockchain and geopolitics. And I am so honored that you made the time to come on, to speak with me about these things and help fill in the gaps. So nice to meet you, Josh. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate you kind of allowing this space to have this conversation and just having me on. It's, I don't do a ton of interviews, so this is cool. It's first. Cool. Well, before we get into the sort of this meat of the topic that I want to cover, just tell everybody a little bit about you and kind of how did you get into this stuff? For sure. So um, in my professional life, I'm a financial planner. Um, I'm a certified financial planner, certified private wealth advisor, and a certified investment management analyst. That probably doesn't matter too much to most people because they don't really know what that is, but I'll just kind of show that those are like the best designations in the industry. I've been in financial advice and planning for about seven years now. I own my own registered investment advisory firm. It's called Alternative Financial Planning. Um, I'm really focused on with my business, have found this niche and just helping people who are invested in XRP primarily um, to do financial planning. So um, there's, I, I don't wanna go down that route, route just yet. I wanna just kind of fill this out a little bit more. So a certified private wealth advisor really is focused on um, family dynamics, legacy planning, charitable giving, um, it's focused on tax planning for high net worth, asset protection. The investment management side is more focused on different markets. It's focused on different investment products, focused on investment consulting, just how do you build and design portfolios, behavioral finance. And then the CFP is kind of like this um, in the center. It's just like this general knowledge about retirement, estate, tax, insurance. And so it kind of that's like sort of how I bring my practice together. Now, my niche has been in the XRP community. and I'll even say there's a sub niche there. I really focused on the first five, six years of my career. I worked in an advisory office and I had some time to like learn. And I really focused on money markets. It was just a weird thing that was fascinating to me. Um, the 2008 crisis was super fascinating to me. Wanted to really understand it. And it took about, boy, I would say thousands of hours to, and I'm still not an expert on the topic by any means. So Unfortunately, you're not talking to a PhD in these topics today, Molly. You're just talking to somebody that has kind of, I was really fascinated. And as we just discussed before the call, when I found XRP, it really was a synthesis for me. It brought together a lot of the ideas that I had been learning about, about in the money markets and different things like that. So, Awesome. All right. Well, I just want to set you up for where I was kind of coming from when I invited you to join me today. It has to do with this blog post you wrote and a couple of sectors that are on the list of things that I cover. I report on them in YouTube channel, Twitter threads. There's these things that are, I'm interested in and they've been until today, like totally separate things. So one of them is the Euro dollar market and this struggle between the Fed and other entities globally over control of the dollar. Tether fits into this because it is essentially a, a modern version of the euro dollar market. And the current kind of like raising interest rates drama with the Fed, according to Tom Luongo, who I learned a lot of this from, is really tied to the Fed trying to reclaim control of the dollar by shutting down all of these offshore lending entities. So that's just one thing that I'm fascinated with, cover it, whatever. So totally separately, we have Jimmy's XRP buyback group where we're looking at ahead the future of money, what happens when everything is tokenized and all the money is now moving on the blockchain? How would that work? You bring in this SEC lawsuit, which kind of disrupted what would have been the organic growth of that asset. Uh, and we have this buyback proposal, which sort of a complex game of chess to sort of force some of these financial institutions to show their hand and share what they're planning to do with it. Uh, and we certainly don't want them to try to undersell the value of the asset to retail holders. So there's quite a bit of complexity going on to that. It creates quite an emotional response in the XRP community, which I actually admit I find incredibly entertaining. And 
<laughs> Lately, one of the things that's a part of that is should an entity, the IMF, the World Bank, whatever, buy XRP from holders, what would we get in return? One of the things we've been considering, it's in the original proposal, is an SDR. So I'm also fascinated with SDRs. Why are they being used? Who? What is the future for them? How is an SDR different than a Bancor? And all of a sudden your blog post yesterday has all of these things in one thing. Like that never happens for me to have these totally separate topics come into place. So I was like, I got to talk to this guy because all the stuff that I'm covering, he's he's into it too. So let's kind of start at the beginning. Okay, can and, you put on the fire hose? <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's start at the beginning. And let's just start with the SDR because that kind of goes back in history, a couple of decades, many decades, probably the 1940s. What do you, how would you describe the SDR and its role in the world to like a five-year-old? Okay, great. First of all, I just want to say I have seen your charts on Twitter. I think it's amazing to be able to pull a complex topic into a very easy, digestible format. That's a real skill. That's like the Einstein genius kind of type of thinking. Um, so I appreciate that. I've seen them and I'm like, wow, this is really good and it's nice and clean. So anyways, just wanted to say that I have seen some of your content. It's really cool. Um, so let's start with the SDR. Um, the SDR is, you know, I think the first time we met, some we were on a space together and somebody was saying that it was a loan. It's not a loan, although I can understand the line of reasoning to get to that um, conclusion, but I think that's just a little, there's a little more nuance to it. I, the way I like to think about it, and I wrote this in an article, is that it's more like an LLC interest to me. Like that's the probably okay. the easiest practical way to kind of understand it is, or maybe like a country club membership, you know, but you, the a country puts in puts up some money to be a part of the club and then they get a certain percentage allocation based on their economy based on the size of their economy and the club is the imf right so countries can be members of the imf and a membership benefit is you get to participate in this financial asset special drawing rights yes. now how do if i'm a country and i want to get in what do i have to do to get an sdr uh, it's, I think there's, I don't know all the exact nuance of it. I was reading through the frequently asked questions on the SDR page before I read that article. It's, it's, there's some nuance. I think it's like preferred members or something. I don't really know all the details, but I think, you know, when I just scan through most countries are participating in the SDR program. So, so I can give money probably, yeah, right? You pay, you, when you become oh. a member, I think then there's probably a few more steps, but then you, you basically get an allocation percentage and then any time the is of the issuance of the total issuance of X SDR. So if I have to put up currency and gold, does that make the SDR kind of a tokenized asset? Like, yeah, it's essentially it's, currency. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. I think that's why I like in the article also, I said it's already an ESDR. It's an electronic token or money. Would I like to use blockchain language, even in just talking about normal money, like SDR. So yeah, we could call it a tokenized asset. It's a, it's uh, backed by the balance sheet of the IMF. And that's the way that I see it. I know it has the basket of five currencies that make up its constituent, like make up its notional value, okay. what it would trade against against another currency. But the real value of the SDR is the balance sheet of the IMF and the, the assets that are on the balance sheet. Why do I care about the balance sheet of the IMF? Like, what does that mean? Uh, just like the same way you would care about the, the balance sheet of the Fed. It, it's a combination of, confidence plus assets. So for instance, when the Federal Reserve, you know, um, issues, issues Federal Reserve notes, they, they have, they carry a value because of the assets that are on the books of the Fed. So the Fed buys the treasury notes in the market and they issue these dollars in exchange for them essentially. But the dollars have a certain level of confidence because of the balance sheet of the Fed. Okay. Now, the same goes with the IMF. The IMF has assets to match its SDR liabilities. Um, that's the simple way. You really can simplify everything in the money view down to a T account, which is basically like accounting, you know, it looks like that. And you have assets on one side and liabilities on the other. So in this case, what's on the asset side of the IMF balance sheet is the gold and the dollars or whatever country's currency they put to the IMF when they sign up. And on the liability side of the SD um, of the IMF's balance sheet is the SDR. So that's their liability that the country holds as an asset. So this is double entry bookkeeping. This is just kind of keeping accounts of, of money, IOUs. And that's just kind of how that works. 
Okay. So if I'm a country, I'm now given my money and my gold and I've been issued these SDRs, what do I do with them? Yeah. I mean, you can do one of three things. You can do nothing. You can sell them for another country's currency, which is one of those five countries who are part of the basket. So you can, okay. you can trade it for dollars, euros, yens, yuans, or GBPs, or you can, um, somebody else could sell it to you. When they, like, if you had excess currency, they could sell it to you, you could give them currency. And so it's basically like if a country comes into trouble, if they're in a liquidity crunch, they can sell this asset and get access to one of the five majors currency, okay. like on demand, really. Is it your understanding that it's used in trade, like commonly? Like, Yeah, that's the problem with it. It's just not really that useful. It's a reserve asset. So it's like, it just kind of sits in the central bank and it's drawn upon if needed. I don't know the volume, uh, the total volume. I really didn't, I didn't deep dive too much into that. I know that it, like it's been issued in 2009. It was issued in 2020. Like there was an increase in allocation. Um, and, and that's what it kind of seems like to me as a non-expert on the SDR, but just as somebody who's observing it, that it's, it's a bailout fund on top of what countries have via their central bank or via their treasury to handle financial crisis, that the SDR is an additional reserve um, that they can draw upon if they need to in a crisis. That's pretty much its only use case right now. Okay, so sort of functions like a piggy bank. Yeah, it's a, it's a bank. Yeah, exactly, a piggy bank like a reserve. All right, so the SDR IMF model was what beat out the Bancor model at Bretton Woods Agreement back in the 40s. Yes. How you describe how Bancor is different than the SDR. Yeah, this is a really, it's, it's, it's very nuanced and I won't do it the best justice, but I can tell you where you can get the best justice on it. Okay. Is there were, it's one of my favorite professors. Like I said, I studied money markets for about five years. His name's Perry. Oh, guy? Yeah. Yeah. He's a, you know, he's, you know, he uses chalk and stuff, but <laughs> I mean, it, it's one of the most fascinating courses. See, like everybody watched the Gensler course, right? And let me just take an aside for a second here. This is just something that I've noticed in the community. There's a lot of people who are really strong on the tech where I'm weak. You know, I always say that I'm not strong on understanding all the tech side. It's just, I'm not, I'm not a computer guy, really. I know how to do a Zoom, <laughs> you know, but uh, when it comes to the money side, that's where I don't, I don't always see the same amount of, you know, just insight or understanding of how the actual international monetary and financial system works, how the money channel, how the plumbing of the financial system works, which really is what XRP is designed to fill the gap. I just don't think, I don't see, you obviously do a lot of study into this field. I hear a lot of stuff out there that I'm like, eh, that doesn't sound right. But anyways, and I think that's one thing I've noticed with the buyback committee too. It's like the people that are most vehemently against the buyback idea are usually more on the tech side. They're usually really strong on understand. I'm just saying, I mean, I don't know for sure. I agree but with you. Yeah, they're usually really strong on like understanding the amendments to the ledger and understanding like the just the tech, how it works. But I, I'm not sure that they understand with the same level, the international monetary and financial system. Um, we discussed this on the committee as well, actually. And when you actually, Perry Merling, I listened to an interview yesterday about his, um, and he, he was talking about crypto and he said like, basically there's a point of convergence where like crypto comes into the real world. Really, it's not right now. Like it's not the real money world. It's kind of a separate thing, but there's a potentially a point of convergence where those things collide. And I think a lot of people in the community are really strong on the tech side, but not as strong understanding. So I'm just going to put that in as a caveat. So what was your original question again? How Bancor is different. Yeah. I, li I did listen to Perry explain because I've yeah. actually audited. There was a video actually before that one in the article. I didn't want to overload the article with videos. So if you go onto YouTube and search like Perry Maryland Bancor, like I don't know exactly what the link is going to be. So just search that and he will explain to you. But basically it was a design difference. So the American Harry Dexter White wanted a system that really gave dollar preference where John Maynard Keynes wanted to design a system that was actually more beneficial for debit countries or countries that had deficits. 
And okay. Dexter White wanted countries that had surpluses to be benefited, which was the US. So Keynes, I just want to explain that to people watching. So yeah. you have a deficit if you essentially import more than you export, like you're more yeah. of a consumer. And you yeah. have a surplus if you are a country who produces stuff and exports more than you consume. And now those roles have actually flipped because the U.S. is now a net deficit country where the other countries like Europe and Japan, China are net importing countries. I'm not sure about Europe, but anyways. Europe um, is definitely deficit. Next exporters, sorry. So it's funny that those roles have switched, but that's just the way the world goes. At the time, the U.S. was a net exporter because the world was just recovering from world war ii there was just there was the marshall plan in japan they had their own plan it was just the u.s was basically you know the exporters to the world at that point in time so they wanted to create a system that was beneficial to the dollar okay because um, they saw that if they were they were basically going to be forced in keynes's vision to become a lender to the world and they they were or they were just not as wild about his idea, but Keynes's vision, and like I said, just watch the YouTube video, he'll do a better job than I do, but Keynes's vision essentially was to set a bank in the middle of countries. And, and let me start with the, the problem as far as I understand it. The problem is that inside of countries, there is expansion and contraction of balance sheets, but there's expansion of the money, money supply. But when there was a gold standard, the the international standard did not expand and contract with the same level of like credit would expand in the US, would expand in Europe, but the gold would remain at a fixed or a small growth rate. You know, it wasn't keeping pace. And so what Keynes said instead was, what if we created this intermediary bank that basically was a net lender or borrower on, it could expand on an international level basically a world central bank that could increase or decrease its balance sheet as needed to keep up with the demand and supply for money on an international level. Gold, unfortunately, doesn't have that quality. It's very disciplined as an asset. It keeps a very tight restriction on money expansion. But Keynes was saying, look, we need more money in our countries. Like we need a balance sheet at the center of the world that can expand. Um, and we don't want to be in the position that we're just having to be stuck with a whole bunch of interest to pay in order to get that expansion. So we want a, an asset and liability column in the middle of the world that can expand and contract without us having to pay, you know, exorbitant interest to use this asset. That, as, that idea was rejected. There was one other nuance that I learned about this is that the surplus countries, which was the U.S., we're going to essentially get taxed too with this SDR model where you weren't going to sort of like a negative interest rate to encourage yes. a lot of spending, a velocity of money sort of idea. And the U.S. was like, why would we want that? So was yes. that part of it? Okay. That's perfect. That's exactly the way you think about it. And when that middle central bank, that world central bank would expand its balance sheet, a surplus country technically would be getting a negative interest rate. And the way that you actually want to think about this, bring this into XRP world for a second, is it's like the burn rate. It really is like the burn rate on the asset in that it's a, it's somewhat of a, a negative interest rate on the expansion of the of the asset and the use of the asset for, it, that, I think so. I'm not 100% positive, but that's kind of the way that I was thinking about it. It sounds a lot like the burn rate. I'm not, again, I'm still working through some of this stuff. So, okay. you know, unfortunately, I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think, why Keynes's idea was rejected is because the U.S. did not want that negative interest rate in order to expand the balance sheet of the world. They wanted to be in charge of the of the balance sheet of the world. They wanted to collect interest on the expansion of the of the U.S. dollar and not be in a position of negative interest rates as it expands. And so they won. That's just that. And that's why the SDR came about, the current SDR. And the problem with it is just really disciplined. And that's why it's not used very much because it doesn't expand well. It doesn't increase the supply of money to keep up with the demand for money because you need 85% vote of all countries and the US can block anything to get it to expand. And so what happened was a computer network developed within the banking system, 
where banks just started creating dollars out of thin air. And these are non-US banks, not Fed affiliated banks. They just started creating dollars themselves. This is what we call the Euro dollar market. I have a video about that. I'll put that in the description. What's funny is people often think it has something to do with the Euro currency. It has nothing to do with the Euro currency. It's just dollars being printed essentially outside of US banks. And that is a problem for the Fed. So let's switch for a second to the Euro dollar market. You said in your blog post, you think the Euro dollar market played a big role in the 2008 financial crisis. Like, how would you describe what that means? The, the 2008 financial crisis, as far as I have studied and learned, is was a run on the euro dollar. That is what happened. What the euro dollar is, is basically banks in other countries without, like, it's not even fractional reserve banking, where a lot of people think of fractional reserve banking, that I have dollars, like somebody deposited dollars, I put them in the vault, and then I lend 90 cents on the dollar. It really isn't even that. It's lending 100, 100 cents on a dollar. It's just creating dollars, liabilities out of thin air, you know, just basically saying we owe you, uh, you know, $100,000. And without any dollar, without $10,000 in the vault, that's the euro dollar in a nutshell, very simply how it works today is like anybody can just basically create dollars out of thin air. And usually, just to keep this real simple, usually, those dollars are just as good as Fed dollars. And they're just as good as United States bank dollars, which are linked to Fed dollars. And that's a and, pretty cool power to print dollars from nothing. Yeah. So everybody thinks that's the Fed's power. That's everybody's power. Everybody has that power in the world. Um, the dollar is more global than ever right now. I wish you I know? figured that power out a long time ago. That would have been cool to think Yeah, about. well, not us. Let, this is a great topic to talk about for a second. There really is a hierarchy of money. And um, it, it looks like this with the bottom of the pyramid. Like you can kind of think of that old Exeter pyramid. If you've ever seen that diagram, it's like gold at the bottom and it fans out to like all these derivatives on top of it. Right, okay. Not exactly that, but it, that's a good model to think about it. That we only use certain types of money within certain parts of that pyramid. So there's like sections of that pyramid, right? And it's in the article. You can kind of see that triangle. Um, but every kind of sector of the economy uses different dollars. But the key is that they're all interchangeable for one another. So in reality, we don't use, and I'll bring this into crypto language for people's minds to like get it. We don't use CBDC. You and I, we use bank stablecoin. That's what we use to transact. 99% of normal people use bank stablecoin, USD, whatever bank you like. You know, I have Pinnacle Bank out here in Wyoming. You probably maybe Chase or something. We use bank stablecoins that are linked one to one to the Fed dollar, the CBDC. But it's very rare that we use CBDC only really when you're using cash. Who uses CBDC? Banks. Mm. Go ahead. I see the, the wheel turn. No, I just said I never created a connection of cash being CBDC. Cash is a direct liability of the Fed. Okay. That's what they're trying to get rid of it. There's not really much need for retail people using direct liabilities of the Fed. Um, there's other reasons as well. It just makes it easier to manage a digital system if there's no outside money. Um, but banks use federal reserve liabilities. U.S. banks use federal reserve liabilities, which is CBDC. There's a lot of fear, though, around this sort of programmable money retail CBDC. Oh, no. I don't think it's going to happen, but do you? No, 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 no. We don't use CBDC. People don't use CBDC. It's not for that. The CBDC is for an anchor. And you listen to the central bankers. This is like, this is what they say. Like the financial system needs a solid anchor. What that means, like I said earlier, that, that every level of the hierarchy is dollars, but they're all have to interchange. They're not the same dollars. They're different dollars, but they all have to change one for one. And this goes from, you know, the banks which use Federal Reserve liabilities to us who you, who's use bank liabilities. But the latter goes even further because it goes even into um, 
securities or shadow banking is what it's called is money market funding of capital market lending. So, you know, money market mutual funds use dollars, but these are different dollars. These are actually like dollars that are backed by repo dollars, which are need to exchange one-to-one for bank dollars, which need to exchange one-to-one to Fed dollars. This is, and then put that Euro dollar system and expand this pyramid outward. You know, this is, this is the challenge of the international monetary and financial system is to keep that one-to-one dollar exchangeability, whether I'm using a Euro dollar in Cambodia, or I'm using a bank deposit in California, or I'm JP Morgan, settling repo transactions, you know, uh, overnight repo transactions, it all is a dollar, but they're not the same dollars. So I'm just going to repeat back to see if I understand that we have this kind of core dollar and then a Mm -hmm. variety of other dollars that are all pegged back to this one dollar. And when things are running great, the pegs one to one and nobody notices or cares that these dollars are actually different. But then something happened in 2008, 2009. And the peg broke. Is that what your article implied? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what happened is that the peg broke in Europe. It broke because a couple of banks were struggling with a mortgage lending arm that went bust. A mortgage lending hedge fund within a bank, Paribas, I think it was, went bust. And that's when they realized that the deposits at Paribas, like it started to become apparent that these Deposit these dollar deposits at Paribas might not be as good as the dollar deposits in, you know, Citibank in the U.S. There might not be that one to one, and the way that they kept that peg is through an interest rate called LIBOR. Okay. So this is the Euro dollar interest rate, which is now I guess been tra- changed to SOFR. Um, but this is the peg that keeps those two tied as close as possible together. So you'll see the the lending rate on federal funds rate, which is Fed dollars within the U.S. Got is it. very close to LIBOR, but there's always just a, t- a slight spread. In 2008, that spread went just through the roof. It was like crazy. Um, I think it was like a couple percentage points on a three-month LIBOR it was difference spread between the U.S. rate. That's what really broke and what would have broken everything. So Tom Luongo covers this LIBOR SOFR thing pretty extensively. You might want to check him out if this is of interest to you. His thesis is that, you know, LIBOR kind of controlled everything. And then the U.S. realized LIBOR is a mess. There's some corruption in there. There's been some cases where the price has been fixed. So part of this Fed raising rates is a a component of a larger strategy to kind of break the U.S. free of this European controlled market. And so far is just sort of an independence effort so that the U.S. financial system can set its own rates and not be tied to this LIBOR system, which sounds like in 2009 collapsed and broke and messed up anyway. So we want we don't want to be a part of that anymore. So it still exists, though, but in Europe and everywhere else. Yeah, I think um, I think the goal is to replace LIBOR. I'm not sure, you know, I just don't know enough if there is like this inside effort by the U.S. to kind of control the dollar into a more domestic dollar. Um, I don't think it's possible. I really don't think that the euro dollar system can be stopped without collapsing the world. Um, whether the peg is so far or LIBOR, um, like you saw recently in the article, it was or the blog I wrote is like there's 80 trillion dollars of offshore liabilities and U.S. dollar denominated liabilities that are linked to FX swaps, and you know I think it's just impossible at this point to shut that system off without a big problem. I mean, there's a theory that that's sort of the whole Great Reset idea is just that whole thing's a mess. It's based on all this crazy debt. Shut it down. Start over with asset backed money. Yeah, and and that is the reason that I think Basel III exists is to manage that system. You know, a lot of people I've heard in the community say, well, that Basel III is designed to bring asset back, gold back deposits into the system. I think it does make that possible, but I think the bigger aim and, and goal of Basel III is to try to bring macro prudential stability into the financial system and it, to keep that into like take that out of jargon to manage the euro dollar system to manage the banks okay. that create euro dollars that's okay. what the liquidity coverage ratio is for 
that's what there's a couple other ratios in there. I'm not an expert on Basel three. I kind of, but what I understand is that's the reason that they have the rules. But I also think that the rules are not quite adequate, adequate that they can't still manage the Euro dollar, even with that set of guidelines and principles in place that banks can still find ways to add more leverage to their balance sheets. And the FX swaps is the BIS basically capitulating and saying, even with Basel III, we cannot regulate this market. There's way more dollars than like we can control with our current regulatory system. That's my kind of just intuitive read of what that announcement and that, that means. Okay. So let's talk about the Euro dollar market in crypto. Stable coins, tether. Yep. Do you do you see tether? We'll just use. I know there's other stable coins, but I want to talk about tether specifically. Do you see tether as a crypto version of the euro dollar market? Yes, that's okay. exactly what it is. It's offshore liabilities in the U.S. dollar denominated. Um, it's a new version, and that's what. No matter how much macro prudential regulation that comes in, this tether is just a great example that there's always a workaround of regula regulation. And people are still going to create dollars. And now there's this new mechanism through digital money. And that's why you hear regulators most focused on stable coins when it comes to the crypto space and regulation. That's what they're really concerned about. Because that's now taking cloud money, fake money, and making it, putting it in real money world. Real, when it enters real money world, it gets a little bit scary. For regulators because they now realize that there's a lot more dollars in circulation that are unmanaged liabilities unregulated liabilities in u.s dollar denominated that's that's what they're really concerned about in my opinion i agree i covered luna pretty extensively a while ago i actually thought it was kind of a neat idea because not because of luna as much as UST, that they had the sort of new mechanism to create all these stable coins globally. UST was the dollar version of it. And what was neat about it was it was one of the first decentralized sort of protocols that was going to very quickly allow you to spend these stable coins in real life. And about two weeks before the Terra collapsed, because I was in a group that loved Terra Luna stuff, um, Alice Finance was a protocol on the Luna Terra blockchain that created this debit card thing that launched and you could take your UST, you could get anywhere on the blockchain and you could now spend your UST with this credit card in stores. So it was the first time that I had seen crypto now being used in real life, which means for the first time UST was literally dollars. Yeah. Two weeks later, well, convertible, one-to-one -one convertibility. Correct. But well, for all intents and purposes well, now, I, it was spendable. But before yeah. that, I had to sort of convert it to Luna, go to my exchange, you know, exchange it. But now I could bypass that. And so that is why I think when people talk about why was Terra taken down when it was, I was like, pretty coincidental that it happened right after that Alice Finance thing where now we could start spending it. So now there was literally, you know, dollars functionality being printed. Yeah, I think that's an interesting conspiracy theory, <laughs> you know, um, but I love conspiracy theory. There's no conspiracy theory that I will not explore. <laughs> it's entertaining. And I think with um, Terra, it's interesting. And this also comes into XRP world a little bit where, you know, Terra wasn't an automated market maker as far as I understand the design of it, yeah. but it was an algorithmic model to manage, to manage that those dollar liabilities to kind of keep a peg of sorts right. um, and what we saw is that it actually failed whether it was conspiracy which is possible and whether you know it's heavy hands that just crushed it for competitive purposes or if it just failed out of flawed design i think there is a valuable lesson in terror that perhaps these algorithms and even automated market maker systems um may not be to the level that they need to be at, or they're still, because in real markets without automated market makers, market makers step in and make markets. And if nobody's there to make the markets, then that's where big hands, heavy hands come in and buy up at super low discounts, where in Tara's case, it just, the bottom fell out. The autumn, the market maker failed and then it fell. As so far what does as that mean for someone who might not 
know this world very like what's a market maker what is that, How does that yeah work? a market maker is a dealer in a financial market and they exist on every rung of the hierarchy of money all the way from like fed to bank all the way okay. to like securities dealers and everything in between and basically it's somebody who's willing to either lend or borrow at a certain rate and most functions require this market maker in order to make a liquid market um and that's just now they're moving that function to a computer algorithm xls 30 is an automated market maker a computer algorithm that trades and buys xrp um, but what we saw with Terra's, you know, algorithmic trading model is that there wasn't a backstop to that system, there, which in normal markets, the Fed is the backstop to any like money market typical in the world at this point. Um, they will basically guarantee a market if it starts to fall out. And that's what protects pegs in our world. Whereas in crypto world, in, in, in this money world, there is no guarantee. There is no peg. We just saw Celsius collapsed. All those people had money in Celsius gone because why? Because they choose to take that risk. There's no guarantee by any institution to back that money. That's their fault. Tough luck. You know, that's the difference and why it really is better to have U.S. dollars right now than tethers. So do you think tether has a pretty good market maker that's enabled it to survive all this sort of FUD and worry that it's going to break its peg no tether probably just has gotten away with crime i mean it, that's what i i i'm not an expert enough to to know for certain but what kind of crime uh it looks like they're like just creating liabilities out of thin air you know they don't they potentially did not actually have the backing that they said they did okay that, um that you know, it's not a one to one convertibility that I saw a chart the other day that is perhaps insolvent on a regular basis. And the thing with a bank run is it only has to be insolvent one time. Um, it all you have to do is lose confidence and it doesn't matter. Now, in our normal market, if somebody lose confidence in a bank, you, what you do is run to the bank, but the Fed will will lend to them. But the Fed will never, ever, ever, ever lend to Tether. So Tether will probably fail. Because it's a, if it's even sniffed that it's insolvent, like enough, it just takes one. It just takes one with no guarantee, no backstop. It takes one run and it's over. So that would be my like base expectation for Tether that it will fail. Um, Do you put Circle in a different category? No, not really, except as has Goldman Sachs backing. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like more institutionalized, but no, I think, what I see is the future is that that real banks have stable coins and maybe Circle is a bank. I'm not sure if they like are a bank. They'll probably help. Um, if they aren't, they'll probably be, become a bank. I just think the current stable coins suck, and I'm just like be blunt about that. But okay. there's no real like like banks that have to hold one to one assets. That sucks. Like that's not a good model. That's like, um, I think money market mutual funds, like certain money market mutual funds have to have that model. But the thing about money market mutual funds is that people don't spend them often. Like that's something that people use to save within a 401k or something. They don't, they don't spend on a regular with a, with a money market mutual fund. So banks are not required to have one-to-one -one capital to liabilities or, or asset to liability matching. They have to have like maybe... 10% of the assets compared to the liabilities. That's a more sustainable model because it allows more expansion. If you have to keep one-to-one -one matching, imagine if Tether was, a, was worth $5 trillion. They have to have $5 trillion in assets. It just, it doesn't work to me. It just, it won't work at the end of the day. So well, you like fractional reserve lending. You think it's good? Well, yeah. I mean, it's the only way that you can expand and contract credit, like to meet the demand and supply of spending in the world. Yeah. You so if we that. move to asset-backed currencies, do you think we would still have fractional lending? You can have asset-backed currencies with fractional reserves. Like, and honestly, if I, I don't, I'm not an Austrian. I don't believe in that theory either because I think if you have one-to-one -one backing of gold, again, you 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 limit so much the expansion of credit that it just it it's not feasible. So you can do an asset back. We we've had these systems before where you have 20% backing, 30%. 10%, you know, where you back your asset with gold, but it's still, it's fractional. It's not, 
It's not one to one. You need more. You need more expansion of money than that. That's at least my lesson from history that that the money supply does have to expand. So my conspiracy theories are going to have very strong limits on fractional reserve within the banking world. Then this carbon credit market is going to be now the new fiat where you can literally print carbon credits out of nothing and use those. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I think carbon credits are definitely coming into play here. And, and here's the other lesson from a too strict system. Come mm -hmm. back to our SDR topic. You know, the SDR and USD Bretton Woods was too restrictive. It just did not allow for the expansion of money that the world needed. And what happened? The Euro dollar market gets created without anybody signing off, without anybody asking why. It just comes into being. It's like, okay. it just gets created out thin air and it's like, hush, hush, we when it starts to like, don't talk about it, but we're just creating dollars and we don't care what they think because we need the money. You know, that would happen if you created a, a asset backed system with gold one-to-one -one backing of your dollars. Like it, they will create new dollars. They will, even in the gold standard in uh, pre-World War One. The real, the real currency was the British pound. It wasn't the gold. The gold was a reserve, but the real actual currency, just like today, the reserve is like the US dollar, Fed dollar, but the real currency is the Euro dollar. That's the real currency in the world. So it will happen the same way if you, if you do a new SDR system, new Bretton Woods, if you do a new backing with gold, it doesn't matter. The credit will, be, will outpace the expansion ability of that of that system and, and new credit will get created somehow. Very compelling point. I know oh. a lot of people I've heard three hundred thousand dollar gold predictions in spaces and I'm just like it's not happening, dude. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but that that won't happen. I it's a it's a possible reality that gold is revalued to deal with some debt. That's a, a time tested method, it could work just fine. We know what it does. They, there's no chance that it goes to like 50,000 is ridiculous in my mind. Like maybe 10, 20, no more than that. But you see, I'm a stubborn Polish guy. So no, I'm just, I'm not only a part Polish. So anyways. <laughs> so I want to now ask you about your blog post where it was titled in defense of the XRP buyback proposal. Just curious, like what were you defending? Like, what's your position on that? Uh, again, coming back to the buyback, like I see a lot of people on Twitter just giving a lot of slack to the buyback committee. I think it was great marketing, like saying that it was a confidential committee, like the, the confidential committee that everybody knows who's in it. But <laughs> it was great marketing uh, and it really got the conversation going, which I think was actually the purpose of that. So I could make an argument against the buyback too, just for the record. I'm not a buyback maximalist. I just- I didn't know that was a thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not that guy and I could see a lot of different realities. Full disclosure also, I'm an investor in Ripple as much like, and I actually own about five times, like I put investment about five times as much into Ripple as I have into XRP, just so everybody's clear, like I may have some bias. I'm not okay. giving any recommendation either. Just going to throw that out here. I, I am an advisor. So like, I can't just like say a whole bunch of stuff, but I have to just put that out there. I'm not giving any recommendation. I am biased as well because I prefer for Ripple to win in every and all situations because I own Ripple. That Do you just see applies. Ripple winning and XRP not winning? No, that's why I buy Ripple because I think Ripple's main business model. And I know everybody's like, you can't say that because the SEC will use this as evidence against us. So like, you know, I think the case, everything's already in on the case. So <laughs> I'm just I, I have no expectation that this YouTube video will be part of it. No, I know, but I feel like that's a thing in the community. Like you, you can't post on Twitter what you really think or <laughs> the SEC will use it. But uh, no, I bought Ripple because when I looked at it, I'm like, well, Ripple owns 50% of it. They own half of it. So if I just buy Ripple, then I am buying XRP. Like, and Ripple also has a business model on top of that. Um, that is pretty sweet as well. So that's just compelled me to be the other Linda P. Jones made an interesting, like people say in the XRP community, like XRP will win at the end of the day. They're probably right. 
I don't really care. As long as Ripple wins too, I'm cool with it. And even if they don't, I still own XRP. But where was the question on that one? <laughs> so I was just curious when you had a, the blog post was titled in defense of the XRP buyback, what were you defending? Like, what was the point of that? Yeah, I was kind of just defending the people who have gotten slammed the last couple of weeks by, like I said, some of the tech guys, Matt Hamilton, uh, West Wind, or I don't know, West something, the Zum guy. Um, I just like, I think that when you really look at the guys, like David Schwartz seems to understand banking as well as tech to me. David Schwartz seems like just a straight genius in a lot of ways to me in like multiple, like he's a, like a Da Vinci or something, you know, like just can, like, but um, I think you've never really seen David Schwartz deny the buyback. Like you've never seen that. And maybe after this interview, you can watch this interview and then come out and deny that it's stupid, but you know, I've never seen him. And I have seen him post on Quora that Ripple's business model is to create liquidity for XRP and then sell it. Well, who did he think is going to buy it? Who has the money to buy a liquid XRP if he's throwing price targets out that are like 10,000. And I'm not saying that's my price target at all, but I'm saying who did he think is going to be the buyer of this 50 billion XRP that could potentially be, you know, a trillion or $5 trillion worth of XRP. Who was going to buy that? He, he said that, that we would like to sell this and it would be hugely profitable for Ripple. So those I just look at a couple of those things. I look at, you know, the outcome that every, all the tech people are saying, well, Ripple is really used or XRP is really used. Is Ripple going to be the central bank of the world? Like, is that, I would love it. I'm a shareholder. Let's go. Like, I'll be, I'll be, that'd be awesome if Ripple's worth $50 trillion and they control the monetary policy of the world through the XRP escrow. I just don't know if that's going to happen. That's so around, yeah. just some interesting thoughts. And then I just look at it and say, well, is it so absurd to think that the IMF may want to be a participant in this banking system that's evolving right before our eyes? Is it so absurd to think that the IMF may want to have a stake in this system as well? Or let me take that point a bit further, that some institution or organization may want to actually have an influence on monetary policy on the XRP ledger. So let me, I see, I see your mind like, what the heck are you talking about? Okay. I'm just trying to connect all these things. Yeah. So how is monetary policy controlled? Like, I'm imagining a world where XRP is like a settlement asset between different currencies, right? Yeah. So the only real lever of control is supply demand, basically, for one currency, another currency, et cetera, like transactions is price. So only thing that really controls it is price and price only really goes, it either goes up or down, you know, but as volume and as, as use increases, price goes up. So what the, do we just want to leave this to a world where price is the only arbiter of supply and demand? That to me, understanding how our current system works is a dangerous world. It's not, it's, it's po a possible world, but it is a potentially dangerous world because banking shocks happen drastically. And when they do, like LIBOR in 2008, just like if you look at the chart, it's like, going, going up. you know, that that's not a sustainable world. A sustainable world is one that like we have today, where if the economy starts heating up like crazy, the Fed can start raising rates. And I know people don't like that comment in crypto world, but you know, having some lever of monetary policy, being able not just XRP price, but also XRP supply. So you're advocating a central bank entity that can step in 
and correct issues if the market is going crazy. Yeah, it's like our bank or example, a, a, a central institution that can expand or contract the money supply with a neutral asset, you know, as as needed, as as international monetary credit is demand either increases or increases or decreases that the supply of international money can increase or decrease. I think the concern can be, well, what happens if this central group is corrupt and making decisions that aren't in the interest of everyone, but they're in the interest of essentially themselves or their club of rich bankers? Well, welcome to the world. I mean, you know, sorry, but this is the world. You know, I, I and I'm not an elitist. I'm not a Freemason. I'm not any of that stuff. I'm just saying, like, I'm not, and I don't have any pro- like problem with anybody that's in a Freemason or anything like that. Like, I don't think Freemasons are like just at their local club, like controlling the world either. I'm just saying, like, just you know how people, you know. But I'm just saying that the when I look at the world, this is sort of the way that the world functions, and the alternative is much more chaotic to me. Now, let me caveat that. I think the XRP ledger 10 in itself dictate money supply and demand. Like it can meet the meet the need for demand and supply of money, but the but the problem is that the only real like it's just price. It's just price goes up or down. Um it's sort of like it's it's like the the world before the Fed. That's the world that could possibly come if Ripple's not controlling it with the escrow, or another central bank is not controlling supply and demand with the escrow. Then the world that could come is like a wildcat banking world, where and wildcatting is a term that's also now used in the oil fields, which like exp like exploratory projects, but in the Before the Fed, there was these, like the system worked like this, that there was just a bunch of banks and they could issue their own money. It's like Euro dollars, you know? And and the problem with that system was that if I lived in San Francisco and I traveled to New York and I wanted to cash in my banknotes one-to-one, there was not good convertibility. And you can imagine why, because it's almost impossible to monitor 300,000 banks across the United States, just impossible. And they call that lumpiness. That was the problem with that system. Now the ledger is very transparent, you know, it and XRP can enable that instant transaction. So that world is possible as well, where it's just completely private and it's completely, you know, credit based on the XRP ledger without a demand supply control by any outside entity. Okay, so you're you're a central bank fan generally, not necessarily the one we have now, but you like that role, whether uh, it's automatic or technical. No, no, I, I wouldn't say that because like you can see the excesses that come from a central bank system it, that we we now have today by mismanagement of monetary policy. And I'm not sure that there's ever any real correct management of monetary policy. Okay. The only thing that I'm saying is that I'm not sure that yet a computer can do it better. Oh, wait till our AI gets good, I guess. That'll be a new AI project. Yeah, and that is that is a potential outcome as well that everybody has a private stable coin. You have a private stable coin and I have a private stable coin on the XRP ledger. Every oh, wow. individual, every corporation, every bank, every, you know, that that's a potential and it's all private and it's very entrepreneurial, very American at its roots. Um, How would we exchange? Like who would decide the exchange rate? XRP. So I would somehow have an exchange rate on this exchange with X. And if usually the exchange rate's based on supply and demand, like the more people that want it, the price goes up, right? Yeah. yeah you and I have a demand and supply for credit as well. You know, did you need to buy a house recently? I, I need to buy a house soon. My supply, my demand for credit just increased significantly. You know, we all have uh, a demand and supply for credit, and not and more than that, we all have a, you know, a um, a credit rating. 
right. every single person in the world has a credit rating, just like every bonded corporation. Ah, right? so you see, like essentially, my FICO score would now play a role in the stablecoin price. Yeah. Yeah, and it now it becomes way more transparent on a decentralized, transparent ledger where everything is on a sing, you know, where everything is seeable, whether it's all an XRP ledger, or if it's multiple ledgers, it's all transparent at the end of the day. So is you this know, how they're going to screw me with my social credit score because I post things I'm not supposed to post on the internet? I don't think it's a, so we already have a credit score. You know, you already have a credit score, whether you want to call it social or just regular, but it's a credit score. You know, you got, you, I have a credit score and you have a credit score and I, mine is not as good because I invest in stupid XRP. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just me. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm just, I love XRP. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that outcome is sort of the one I see as well. Um, but I do see, I don't see the central bank digital currency as that big of a deal. I don't, like I, we won't use it for normal people. I don't expect that we will use it. It's an anchor. It will be important when stuff goes bad. Then people will flood into their national currency as a as a like a last resort, kind of like a more solid credit. But normally we'll just use our we'll use our bank stable coins, then it'll probably be our like personal stable coins, and then you know, that, yeah, that's probably the evolution I see. All right, I did have one last question. Kind of a big one. Probably should ask this earlier on, but it's good for the end. You have to watch all the way to get to it. People in the XRP world love to debate this topic about whether XRP will become the SDR. What is your point of view? Because I know that was the sort of point of the spaces we did the other day with Joe. Yeah. What do you think about that question? Yeah. I, no, I don't think it will become an SDR. If it did, it would ruin the XRP, like in all possible capacities because like we said earlier that sdr system was designed to be a very disciplinary system okay. what if xrp the- were to be Bancor then yeah they would have to they would have to if it was going to operate at an international level and it's not like the imf would own the xrp ledger they would not own all of the xrp there's no way i see that scenario either it's just not necessary you do not need to control the entire supply of an asset to control a market. You need how much of the of the treasury market, the treasury bill and bond market or note market does the Fed control? You know, maybe like 10%. I don't, I don't know exactly the amount that's on their balance sheet, but they can control, you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars with that small amount of eight billion, eight trillion dollar balance sheet. They can control um hundreds of trillions well even maybe a quadrillion dollars of assets they can control all of that with eight trillion dollars does that make sense no do you want me to dig that a little deeper and because that ties into why i just don't i have like my my expectation that they confiscate my xrp like in a in a buyback as a person is zero or like one percent and i think it's good that the buyback committee is doing what they're doing for, because insurance is usually less than 1% possibility, but it still could happen. So it's insurance, but you know, I just don't, I don't see the, like any international body, whether it's BIS or the IMF needing to control more than 10%, 20. If you own 50% of the supply, you probably own way too much. Like, and, and the yeah, other thing- yeah. about, People familiar with the 51% attack idea, you don't have to have control over every single node in a network to be able to control. You just need a certain percentage. Is that your yeah, and I don't think in the XRP ledger that, I, and this is the tech size, I'm a little more weak on this, but like, I don't think that the con- owning of XRP is equivalent with controlling of the nodes. I and agree. I just was using the analogy that you don't have to control everything to control something. You don't have to yeah. Control yeah, so I think that like a distribution model could be interesting, like in the SDR sense where IMF buys it and then loans it to all its member countries or deposits it to all its member country, but it it has to be used. And what I do see as potentially a valuable function is the ability for a central organization with a significant amount of XRP to be able to control, pull the levers on supply and demand um, as opposed to just letting price be the sole arbiter 
of demand and supply for credit, okay. which is a possible alternative outcome that still could work, but I see this outcome as a little bit more, um, more like the current system we have and more, more sustainable, at least in the near term. Related to this, I kind of was wondering about this the other day. If we have this new system where you mentioned where everyone has their own stable coin or we move to a world of many, many currencies because they're so easy to create and you could back them with assets. Why do you even need basket currencies like the SDR anymore? Like what problem does that solve that we need solving? Oh, yeah, that's the kind of the whole point on a lot of levels. Like if there was this like bridge asset at the center of the system, you right. don't need a basket cur currency, first of all. You also don't need offshore currencies anymore. Like you don't in Brazil need to, to take debt in US dollars. That's just becomes unnecessary and, and, and redundant. When you have a peg to XRP, Brazilian real, Brazilian credit, Brazilian personal credit, like it's all linked to XRP. There's no need to have offshore dollars, there's no need to have basket currency. Yeah, that's, it's redundant. I guess the only question I would ask is, well, sometimes people like to store dollars for wealth, like a piggy bank, because mm -hmm. they were confident that the value of the dollar would stay stable relative to maybe the an emerging market country. How does that get addressed in this tokenized world? Yeah, I think like your reserves would be your central bank digital currency if you do want to do that i mean that would be the more logical reserve asset of course anybody who issues assets on the xrp ledger has to use xrp to collateralize those assets so in that way there is a reserve function with xrp as well um, in that like those assets are collateral for creation of S equity or debt on the ledger. Um, so yes, XRP would be used as well as a reserve asset, but not in the sense I don't think, of course people will, will do, you know, they will get dollars in Ghana and they'll keep them and they'll spend CDs and they'll keep dollars. So you do maybe have that outcome in the long term um, with this bridge asset as well, that it, it may, become too much hoarding of, of the bridge asset, which again comes to my original point where it does make sense to have the ability to expand and contract the bridge asset. And that's why I could see an outcome where, and, and, and it, it's so simple, like I said in the article, it doesn't have to be a complex, like we're collecting everybody's XRP because it could just be that they just buy the escrow. Like how hard is that? I mean, that's the difference between now and 1933, in my opinion, is that it, it's not like in 1933, there was just this big pile of gold that was sitting in Mexico that, you know, 50% of the world's gold was just sitting in some neutral vault or some vault that some company owned. Um, whereas today, that is the case. I do think though, with the escrow thing, there are some tech limitations in that it's managed by smart contracts. I don't know if it would be possible for one group to come in and buy the escrow at once. It's because you could, every time it was released, buy it all up maybe, but. Yeah, exactly. That's the way that I kind of see it is like, yeah, it's managed by this escrow function for in the meantime. Um, and I don't know if that's reversible at all and it may not be, but still somebody comes in and buys it. And then as it gets distributed, they like Ripple does today, like they could just not sell it and or only sell it as needed into the market um, to maybe increase that money supply a little bit. So I just look at just to kind of wrap up, because I know we were probably we're running out of time. I think that's where I see like the buyback can make sense in a monetary perspective if you really do see this bridge asset. Um which the bridge asset, there's a sentence at the end of that article. I don't have it pulled up right now, but I really liked it. I'm like, oh, that was good writing. Um, but the elimination of offshore dollars is really what this bridge asset could bring to the table. And what does that mean for macro prudential regulation? That means that the world has just become a lot easier to regulate. 
the expansion and contraction of money is now a lot easier to manage because now you have the USD and all its stable coins that are pegged to it, but you don't have the USD and all its stable coins in America plus all its stable coins in Africa and all its stable coins in Asia. You just have to manage a domestic economy at that point. You have to manage credit within your economy, expand and contract money supply just within your economy to meet the needs of your, that's much easier than managing the entire globe of dollars right now. It, it, it's an impossible task. They'll fail. Unfortunately, they will fail because it's impossible. Right now, as we speak, the Fed guarantees every market in the world. And I say every as in every. Every market in the world, every financial market is guaranteed by the Federal Reserve Bank. That is completely unsustainable. It, it will probably fall out at some point because the Fed's balance sheet, eventually people will lose confidence that the Fed's balance sheet is solvent and sustainable because they're managing a quadrillion dollars of assets with a trillion dollars of, or of liabilities with a trillion dollars of assets. Eventually that, I don't know, what's it called? Come home to roost? Like that will fail. That will fail because it's not sustainable. It does line up with Jerome Powell's statements that there's room for more than one reserve currency. So it doesn't really serve the Fed, as you said, to have to manage dollars in all these other countries when they have no legal authority to do any of that. Like these banks yeah. in the Caribbean are not members of the Fed. Like they don't have any authority over them. They're not in the US. Yeah, exactly. So the Fed gets all the downside of, of the world. You know, they get all the risk and none of the, you know, they have none of the responsibility or like regulation of these banks, but they get all of the responsibility for bailing them out when they go bust. So it's a bad deal for the Fed. The other countries don't like it. It's called exorbitant privilege. They hate that the US Fed can control, like you said earlier, the Fed is crushing the Euro dollar market right now because those countries issue assets and they issue debt in dollars like in a couple of years ago when interest rates were at nothing. And now interest rates are paying back in dollars that are 5.75 for lending at the at the Fed funds rate or whatever that rate is. So you know, they're, they're paying back much more expensive dollars than they borrowed in. Um, and that is crushing them, you know, and they, other countries hate the system too, but they're stuck with it. The Fed stuck with it until, you know, eventually it just, it just, the people lose confidence in the Fed. That's, that's the end game there. Do you think we're going to have a flip the switch type change where we wake up one day and we have a totally new financial system? It, I think there's one of two options, you know, um, regulators, financial authorities could be proactive and like make some of these changes now, like identify the fact that the offshore dollar is an unsustainable system, propose the alternative, make a smoother transition into that system. Um, that's like through agreements and like an international conference or something, or they could blow up the world and then try to fix it. You know, those are the two options. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Josh, this has been amazing. If people want to follow you or keep tab with sort of the content you put out, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a Twitter, so just follow me. It's Joshua Barbin one, I think. And, um, also, I have a Discord. So like what we talked about today, yeah. it's really not even like my expertise or business. This is just things that I think about. And, you know, um, my, my expertise is actually in financial planning and, you know, working with people on managing their money. And also one thing that I really try to help people with right now is turn this investment into something really personal to turn it from like an interest in the tech and an interest in the narratives and the conspiracies and all that to 
like, how is this going to affect my family? How is this going to affect my life? How am I going to make good choices? How am I not going to lose it? Like, what are the things I can do now to plan with it? You know, that's what I actually do on a regular day-to-day basis. Um, I have a discord that I priced the lowest year at $30 because I was just like, I feel like everybody in the community should have access to a financial plan. And I price, I have some higher tiers and stuff where it's like a little more in depth, but um, that's, that's like my day-to-day passion with the XRP community is helping people get financial plans. So you can always check that out. That links on the Twitter page as well. So. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. This was really cool. We covered so many topics. Hopefully if you watch this, you could follow our jumping around. Yeah. That's the sad part. Molly. Like I, you, I, was I feel like you said like your brain like was now like, wow, something came together in an article. And then we just like scattered it. All <laughs> <laughs> like, did we really even cover anything here? Is there any real like, well, my goal was to start to start to make the connections between the Euro dollar markets and XRP future. How do they all sort of fit together? And it, my summary from this is that the Fed doesn't want to be in charge of everything anymore, meaning all the money globally. It's just too impossible to manage. So we're probably going to evolve and shift into a new monetary system. There'll be a lot more currencies which used to be a pain in the neck because it was hard to swap them, like your banking example from the 1800s where you had your money from two different banks. Now we have these blockchain-based exchanges where you can easily change one thing for the other. So that barrier has been removed. It also alleviates any country from trip and dilemma because nobody's got to sacrifice their own supply, production, manufacturing, whatever you want to call it, to be the global reserve asset. And all of this new transaction stuff will happen maybe ideally on the XRP ledger via these products that Ripple had among others have been building. And this is kind of how it all fits together in my, my worldview. Yeah. That, wow. That was like amazing. Like how you just brought that all home. Like, and I, I think just a, like my thought, my final thought is like, I really see the XRP ledger as the Euro dollar. Like it's a, it's just a computer network, just like the Euro dollar is a computer network that, settles and messages that's what it does it settles and messages it's a little more advanced than the euro dollar market it's it's just a better technology and that's why i kind of think that it could fill that that gap really nicely as as a world payment currency so anyways you know should it be managed by the imf should it be should there be a management on supply and demand of the of the asset should it float freely and let price just be that arbiter that's something we'll find out. I mean, and I think we're not going to be the ones that decide that at the end of the day. That may just come upon us or or it may be decided. But, you know, I think we're in a good space. I'm really, I really love working with the XRP community. I love these conversations. So thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you very much, Josh. See you. Talk to you.